Hey everybody, it's Dr. Jensen and welcome to module five, Media and Courts, part one. So we're gonna dive into some new territory in the criminal justice system and you have several readings and other materials that will help you do this and show you a couple different sides to this that you can also use in your upcoming assignments. So let's get started. So first we're gonna talk about just a brief introduction of the courts, the purpose of the courts, how media plays a role, court portrayals, and then portrayals of attorneys. We'll get to see how this works. I have some interesting things to show you. So courtrooms really do provide an important social construction function for society. They resolve disputes according to the law. They also determine which behaviors are acceptable. They set precedents for future behaviors based on what past rulings have been. They also draw formal boundaries in society, which if you've ever read Durkheim in a sociology class, you know that um, it's part of finding out uh, boundaries and, and sanctions and norms by kind of pushing behaviors to extremes. And so it kind of says, nope, this is the limit. It also legitimizes society's laws and policies as um, realistic and applying to everyone. It legitimizes government agencies and social structures that have authority over our lives. It also provides a reflection of the values of society. So you can look at court rulings over time and see kind of how values have changed in our country, for the better or worse, depending on how you see them, but it gives us a roadmap of how things have changed in, in the perspectives of American culture. So with media in the courts, really anything that influences the public image of the courts is going to influence the ability of the, the courts to accomplish these goals because um, they want to appear legitimate, fair, and uh, efficient. And those are very, very hard perceptions to manage in our legal system. But again, these are very, very highly constructed in different media. So think about it this way. First, we have a media depiction of the court presented to the masses. Now remember, public access is required by law to have some kind of representation to people outside of the courtroom. And this, in turn, influences the public's perception of courts generally. This, in turn, then determines the expectations that society has of how courts should run and then this in turn determines how courts actually run in practice. So it's a very sequential line that we follow with media. So media has much more influence over courts um, than maybe we might have expected previously. So when we think about the judicial portrait that's painted within media, these are the kinds of things that we run into as, as challenges. So entertainment media's construction of the courtroom is really different than what actually happens in a court. I always challenge all criminology majors to attend a court uh, setting of some kind, whether it's an arraignment or a trial or, uh, or a sentencing hearing, if they can. Because when you have an experience with court, it starts to change your perception of what you were hoping you might see based on maybe something you saw on TV or in the movies. So it's really important to get a more clear picture of how judges act, how attorneys act, how the accused acts, and all the other people in the courtroom work group. We also have infotainment style trials that are high drama, that make great daytime television, and we'll talk about those examples in a moment. We have the issue of pretrial publicity and how to manage that to keep it from swaying the public opinion and certainly influencing those jurors we mentioned this briefly in the last module when we talked about CSI effects. We also have government access to media information and media access to government information. And the courts often make rulings on this, um, which is interesting to look at as well. Um, and then finally, the judicial system is portrayed as a source of high drama and infotainment where sweeping changes over people's lives are created um, or lives are destroyed and changed forever. Um, so it is a higher drama environment than maybe what we saw in corrections, but it also contains a lot of challenging um, situations because of that high drama. 
So when we talk about media depiction of the courts, we get some distorted pictures both indirectly and directly. Indirectly, courts are alluded to as soft on crime. Most criminals are recidivists. They're just gonna come back through the revolving door of the courtroom again. And uh, the legal system is portrayed as a due process obstacle to justice, as some necessary evil that we have to go through, even though it should be very clear what we need to do with this person. So that's kind of what we see generally discussed in media. When we look at media dep depictions directly, um, because it's part of a story of a film or, or a TV series, basically we see these presentations. We see attorneys and judges in the crime fighters role, kind of like what we saw with law enforcement, where they're very involved in the offender's life and what happens to the offender, when they might really serve a more passive role um, than we would see portrayed. We also see these stories being told as high stakes, dramatic trials, um, again, mostly criminal, not civil, because criminal trials are much more exciting. Um, and we also see some of these themes. So we see an overrepresentation of violent crimes. We also see a focus on criminal law versus civil. We see a lot of litigation, which to me is probably the worst injustice that happens in a media depiction of the court, because you have to remember over 95% of criminal cases are plea bargained. They never go to trial. You will never see attorneys litigating professionally in the courtroom. Remember, plea bargains are really a deal between the defense and prosecution for a conviction of a lesser offense in exchange for a guilty plea. Now, plea bargains are kind of a dirty word in society, but this is how the criminal justice system dispenses of most cases, which saves a lot of time, money, grievance, emotions, all kinds of stuff by moving cases through an already backlogged system. In order to ensure due process and so forth, um, we can't handle every single crime with the trial. There are over 40 million felonies that happen in the United States alone. And if every single one of those were brought to trial, nothing would ever get done. So essentially plea bargaining is actually protected by the US Supreme Court, where now if a plea bargain is on the table for an offender, the constitution requires that that plea bargain be made known to the offender um, so that they can make a decision as to what they do. Because it's not that plea bargains are a part of the criminal justice system, they are the criminal justice system because of how often we use them and how they dispense of cases. So again, not the maybe best way to do this, but it saves us the cost and, 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 uh, and involvement of a full-blown trial and many times still grants the punishment um, and the offender some leniency in that kind of an exchange. So it's not that they're necessarily getting off. They still get punished. They are still convicted. They still have a record, um, but they have to plead guilty. They may not want to plead guilty. Um, but again, that is the deal that is struck, which is supposed to have a negotiation and, and uh, rewards on both sides. When we look at courts and film, films were really the first source of construction. And uh, we look at all kinds of classic films that had big courtroom dramas. One of my favorites would be To Kill a Mockingbird, um, where we have these epic speeches and rebuttals and, and stuff like that with, with attorneys, um, where we have kind of um, you know opening arguments and closing arguments, and it was, it was high drama. This very much differed from other constructions of the court. The focus on, was on obstacles to justice in the system and society, not necessarily individual offenders. So it was more of the court getting in the way of what productivity and, and society was. We also saw an overrepresentation of murder, abuse of power, and sex or sexualized crimes. Again, being the high drama that people wanted to see. So this again demonstrates from the Surrette text the operation of backwards law, which is a presentation of criminal justice and crime by media that is really opposite of reality or very clearly distorted. Okay, so it makes us think that all criminal cases have to do with murder, abuse of power and sex, and they don't. Most criminal cases are nonviolent. And uh, again, it's just not accurate with what actually happens in society. This is probably one of my favorite distortions to look at as a professor. So when we look at courts and television, what comes to my mind is Judge Judy. She's been on the air forever. 
This really evolved from fictional and highly unrealistic to showing more non-trial and sometimes even backstage aspects of practicing law. But again, the trial and the courtroom is front and center most of the time. So this is where we see infotainment, docudramas based on real cases. And I always like to bring out this little tidbit about Judge Judy. So Judge Judy's salary is $47 million annually. She's one of the highest paid TV stars while a Supreme Court Justice makes approximately $255,300 annually. So when we talk about importance of a judge, we have a highly entertaining judge that makes a great deal more money than a judge who we might say impacts our lives on a much larger level that's much more important. We don't reward it the same way. But when you have TV contracts, it's a different story. So to me, we don't often economically place importance on which justice would be um, kind of the one that impacts our lives more. Um, I don't know, maybe Judge Judy impacts your life on a daily basis. I don't know that she does for me, but uh, I thought that was fun to look at. Some current social constructions, again, that we look at with courts and media through film, television, and media trials are that they emphasize very rare events that aren't commonly found in the justice system, uncommon charges that are, again, very specialized, um, improbable evidence, kind of the unbelievable stuff. And you, you kind of see this with the Casey Anthony trial in particular. You also have unlikely interactions. And the more the drama and the, and the trial goes on, um, the better it is for, for keeping viewers' attention. But overall, it's a very unrealistic picture of the courts. With attorneys, the depictions are very interesting. Attorneys are shown as crime fighters. They're largely male, um, and they specialize in criminal law. Now, we know most attorneys do not specialize in criminal law. There's a lot of specialties of law out there, and most are not criminal. Um, but we start to think that all attorneys have some kind of expertise in criminal law. They do not. <laughs> more, they are more likely than police officers to be shown as greedy, especially when it comes to fees and billable time. They are nearly as likely as police officers to be shown as corrupt. So again, these are the portrayals we see in media of attorneys generally. Now when it comes to female attorneys, it gets pretty interesting. So this assumes um, that there are some incompatibilities of social roles of attorneys and women. So we start to see arguments of people being unfit mothers or poor spouses because of the demanding career of law so that they are really kind of postured as out of place in the context. They can also be depicted as career women or even dominated by sexual conflicts or repression. So their personal lives are highly sexualized and dramatized um, parallel to their legal career lives. They are often shown as young, white, single, childless, and in lower status positions. And again, it's kind of that underdog against all odds that makes for a female attorney protagonist in many, many films. Um, but that's a very common stereotype that we see. Uh, female attorneys often fare better than female police officers as far as how they are portrayed in the media. They are portrayed as very intelligent, um, not necessarily um, kind of you know, aggressive, uh, but they are um, assertive and tenacious. Uh, so a little bit more positive way to, to be portrayed. But uh, in any case, I wanted to end here. So we've talked about the courts, television attorneys, um, different social constructions and how courts work. And we'll continue with part two. Let me know if you have questions. Thanks.